What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is David Healy. David is a professor of psychiatry at Cardiff University in Wales, and he's published more than 200 peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals, as well as being author of more than 22 books. He's also the co-founder of a new organization, Risk.org. So welcome to Madness Radio, David Healy. Well, it's good to be here. David, it's really great to have you on the show. Your published books and articles are a wealth of information, critical of psychiatry, critical of the pharmaceutical industry, and you've done a tremendous uh, amount of work in making drugs safer for people. So I really want to congratulate you and honor you for your leadership in this field and welcome you to the show. And I just wanted to start out by just, if you could just say a little bit about your own uh, background. How is it that you became interested in pharmacology and, and what was it that maybe Um, alerted you that there were such big problems in the field and and got you started on the path of being uh, something of of a crusader? I think the reason, the main reason to get interested in pharmacology was back when I um, went into the mental health field first, this was the early 80s, the drugs looked like a good tool to probe the brain and how it works, to help us understand why we think and feel and behave the way we do, okay? It looked like it would shed light on how the brain uh, the brain supports the mind okay now in terms of becoming a crusader i don't think i am um at least uh, that's not the way i've viewed things the way i view things i think from early on i would have thought i was a fairly conservative and fairly straight doctor you know who viewed pills as possible poisons that could cause problems but what i think i've found is that the field seems to have been moving a way from me rather than me moving away from the field. Over the last 20 to 30 years or so, what I think we've seen is a change in the attitude many doctors have towards pills. Well, once they regarded them as poisons, which could be awfully helpful, but needed to be used with care, they've tended increasingly to view them as fertilizers, that they should be used as much as you can, that you should spread the fertilizer as widely as you can. And the place, I guess, where this comes out most clearly is in the case of children. 20 to 30 years ago, there's no way that anyone would have thought that it was a good idea to put huge numbers of children on antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, and things like this. And it's not just those drugs, it's all kinds of drugs. We didn't see the same number of kids on asthma drugs, on statins, and drugs like this either. So there's that. But there's also a thing that, that became a little clearer to me as well. 20 to 30 years ago or so, nobody would have thought that it was quite likely that most of the literature that we have on drugs and how they work is actually being ghost-written. This would have been inconceivable to most people. Can you explain a little bit about what ghost-writing is in, in pharmaceutical studies? Most people looking at a journal like the New England Journal of Medicine or the British Journal of Psychiatry or the American Journal of Psychiatry, see all these articles there, which are authored, it seems, by the biggest names in the field, professors of medicine or professors of uh, psychiatry in Yale and Harvard and various other institutions. And most of us 20 to 30 years ago would have figured that these people wrote those articles. I mean, if it appears in a journal like the New England Journal of Medicine, it absolutely has to be an honest article. But in fact, it's now clear that pretty well all the articles that deal with drugs that are on patent across medicine, this isn't just the mental health field, this is true for respiratory medicine and cardiac medicine and other areas also, that pretty well all these articles are ghostwritten. That is, they've been written within uh, the pharmaceutical company, in essence, or by a a ghostwriter who's working for a, a company, a medical writing company that works to the pharmaceutical industry. And what they've done is they've been given part of the data from the clinical trial that's on this drug, and they've been asked to produce an article that will help sell the pill. They'll often or usually have certain commercial objectives for the article. That is, the company wants this article to appeal to a particular group of doctors. 
And the job of you know, the ghostwriter is to make the drug look good and to hide the problems. Now, they can do this job extraordinarily well, sometimes to the point where they can take a negative trial of the drug. Uh, that's a trial where the drug has failed. And by clever use of words and data, they can make it appear as though the drug has, in fact, worked well in this particular clinical trial. And also, they've got ways to hide the adverse events that may have happened in the actual trial. For instance, they may indicate in the article that they're only going to report on the adverse events that occur at a 10% rate or are more, when conveniently, for instance, in this particular trial, it could have been that the rate at which children became suicidal happened at a 9% rate. I mean, they aren't actually lying, but they do omit the crucial material that the average doctor who's going to use the pill needs to have, and more to the point, the crucial material that any of the rest of us that may be put on these pills needs to have. And so 20 years ago, when you entered the field, this would have been considered just outrageous. Yes, the view that most doctors would have had back then, in fact, all of us, would have had back then was that it was inconceivable that people like me who've done clinical trials would allow a thing like this to happen. The whole process that led to this happening probably started around the early 80s and it was only around 15 to 20 years ago or so that people began to realize that it was happening. For the most part, most doctors still don't realize that is happening. They still think that the articles that they see in the biggest journals in the field are genuine articles rather than adverts for the pill. So why is it that you think that you sort of kept your original perspective on what was right in the field, whereas other doctors just kind of went along with this uh, shift to ghostwriting and misleading about the dangers of, of, of medications? Why, why have most doctors slipped into a collusion with things um, and I haven't. That's a little hard to answer. Partly perhaps it may be linked to the fact that back in the 1990, uh, after uh, the SSRIs had come on the market in the UK first, uh, I was among uh, the first people who would have used these drugs, put people on them. So these are the SSRIs, the antidepressants like Prozac and Paxil and Effexor? Yes. And putting people on these drugs, they were, uh, you know, the pills did help some, but they also made other people anxious and nervous and become suicidal. This seemed very obvious and clear to me. But when I tried to report it, when I tried to write it up uh, as an article to outline what could happen on these pills, when I tried to talk to colleagues about what I was seeing happen, the response I got was that people just didn't believe it. I was being told that, you know, you're just wrong. The things that you say you're seeing in front of your eyes, that these just aren't happening. Now, I don't think I'm a good person. I don't think I'm better than any of the other doctors that have close links to industry now than I have. But what I think I am is a slightly stubborn person. And when I'm being told that the white I can see in front of me is actually black, I tend to dig my heels in and say, well, no, it's white. And uh, I think that's probably what happened. And in order to try and support the evidence of my own eyes, I came to doubt the evidence that other people were offering me. I mean, what we've had is a world where 30 to 40 years ago, if a doctor put you on a pill and you and they saw a thing happening to you, both of you tended to believe that the drug could cause it, and the usual response was to halt the pill. And if the problem cleared up, most people agreed the drug had caused it. But increasingly, with people becoming suicidal on Prozac, what the company and the regulators like FDA did was to say, well, we've got people on one side saying they think they see this happening, but that's anecdotal. The clinical trial evidence shows that it's not happening. But if you're going to be properly scientific, you should believe the evidence from clinical trials and not the evidence of your own eyes. Now, I guess I just found that unacceptable. And I still to this day tend to say that we should believe the evidence of our own eyes. And if the clinical trial evidence points to, to a different outcome, then we need to think about, well, are we being shown all of the clinical trial evidence? Are what is it that's caused clinical trials to go wrong and produce the wrong answer? 
And so was your challenging the perceived wisdom around uh, suicide risk in the antidepressants? Was that what led you to lose your position at the uh, Toronto um, Center for Mental Addictions and Mental Health? Yes, it was. Around 1990, when the first reports came out in the United States by Heischer et al., there was a very famous article which came out of Harvard by a group of Boston uh, psychiatrists saying that Prozac could cause people to become suicidal. Around just the same time, uh, I had had a patient whom I had put on the drugs, in fact, two patients, and they had become suicidal. So I tended to leave the Taisha et al. Uh, report and wrote my own article up and also began to talk about the issues. So over the course of the next 10 years or so, uh, I gave a few talks and wrote a few different articles saying that this kind of thing could happen and gave more talks and wrote more articles about other problems that pills could cause, like uh, getting hooked to the antipsychotics or getting hooked to the SSRIs or things like this. Around 1999, I was approached by the University of Toronto to move over there to a post there. And they would have known pretty clearly the views that I had, but they still seemed to think that it was a good idea to have me there. And I was interviewed and offered a job uh, and said yes and was preparing to move. When they held a meeting, which was, it was a meeting uh, to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the university department and the 150th anniversary of the mental health service there. And they asked a bunch of very big names in the field to come and talk, including me. One of the other people who was there was a person called Charlie Nemeroff. And at the time, Charlie Nemeroff was the professor of psychiatry at Emory University and was widely regarded as the most powerful man in the mental health field. His support or lack of support could make or break people. At the time, he was to be an expert witness in legal trials on the opposite side of the argument to me. I had gotten involved around this time in the a few different cases where people who had uh, either committed suicide or homicide or things like this on an antidepressant had legal cases and the Lawyers trying to find experts found that they couldn't. I mean, these were all cases that were being heard over in in the States, uh, but the lawyers there couldn't find any experts that were prepared to give expert input for them. So they had to go abroad. They had to go overseas, and they tracked me down. And I said, sure, fine, you know, I've got the view that these drugs can cause problems. Let's be clear, though. I mean, there may be loads of people who go on these pills and go on to commit suicide on them or go on to commit homicide on them, and I will think that the drug hasn't caused the problem. So just because it can cause a problem doesn't mean that it always has. You've got to look at the case closely and work out if in this case it in fact did cause it or not. So in the case that I was involved in that Charlie Nemeroff appeared to also be involved in, it seemed to me quite clear that the drug had caused the problem. This is a man called Don Shell, who at the time was 60, and he'd been put on Paxil 48 hours previously. As it turned out, he'd had a history which the doctor who put him on at the Paxil didn't know, which was a history of responding poorly to SSRI like drugs. That's drugs like Paxil. And 48 hours after he was put on the Paxil, he put three bullets to the head of his wife, three bullets to the head of his daughter, three bullets to the head of his granddaughter before killing himself. Now, this was a very clear case for a number of reasons, and I had agreed to get involved. And this was around the time that I was supposed to be moving to Toronto also. And at a previous meeting, Charlie Nemeroff had made it clear that he didn't think that it was a good idea that I'd be involved in this case, and he didn't like the research that I was doing to show that the drugs could cause a problem, and that it might be the end of my career if I weren't careful. And sure enough, after the meeting in Toronto, at which he gave a talk also, and where the talk that I gave was rated by the audience as the best talk that day, and the one that he gave was rated as one of the poorest talks that day, he had a word with the university and told them that they didn't really want to hire me. It 
wasn't a great idea. And uh, later on that evening and over the next few days, the university thought about it and they got in touch with me and told me they were going to terminate the appointment. So it was very interesting to say the least. So that led to a $6.4 million settlement from Paxil. That was the drug that that Shell was on when he committed these murders, a settlement against GlaxoSmithKline. Is that right? So you you won that case. Yes, it was actually the first time that a company had ever lost a case based on a behavioral effect of their drug. And then after that, were warnings put on the antidepressant drugs that they could cause to suicidal and violent behavior? No, it took a few years. It took three years after, like it's probably four years after that case. In in 2004, uh, that's when the FDA hearings happened, uh, which put the black box warnings on these drugs for children. Now, in fact, these drugs cause just as many problems for all age groups. Uh, it's not just children that they cause, uh, or that they can cause problems for. They can cause uh, the same kind of problems for any age group. So, David, in the Shell case, there were three people that were uh, murdered by this man who was on Paxil, but the scope of the injuries and, and deaths that are caused by adverse medications, not just psychiatric medications, is enormous and underreported, underdressed. The estimate from FDA is that somewhere between 1 in 100 and 1 in 20 of the serious problems that drugs cause get reported to them. What will probably happen is in the 1 in 20 group, there will be the people who go on a, an antidepressant, say, and maybe become obviously homicidal, possibly suicidal. Very clear things happen to them. Uh, and it's easy for the person who's on the pill to see them happening. So that will lead to them being reported. But, you know, you can go on antidepressants as well. And most antidepressants actually affect the way the heart works. And this can lead you to just drop dead out of the blue. Your heart can begin to misfire. Now, that's the kind of thing which you're not, as a person on the pills, you're not going to be aware that the pills could be causing this. So that kind of event probably gets reported even less than 1 in 100, possibly no more than 1 in 1,000 of the people that have uh, the problem actually get a report filed that they have a problem. And if you think about it, this is quite extraordinary in the sense that if you or I put a parcel in uh, the post and we're told that, you know, that uh, the company who was going to get it to the place you wanted to go didn't track where the parcel went and couldn't guarantee that it was going to get there and half or more of the parcels went missing, you know, you wouldn't use the postal service. That would be the end of it. But in the case of the most important things that are for us, when you bring your children to the doctor to be treated and the doctor isn't keeping an eye on what could go wrong, that isn't keeping an eye on whether your child's going to get to where they need to get, it's quite extraordinary that we let this happen, you know, that we don't insist on people keeping a very, very close eye on just what actually happens when you take one of these pills. And in fact, it's very, very short-sighted because to this day, the single best way to discover new pills still is by keeping a close eye on what actually happens to them. That, you know, when people take the drug for one reason and a completely different thing happens, like when they took Viagra for their heart and found that completely different things happened, that's still the best way for us all to find the new pills that we need for the various different things that we still need new pills for. So even though the adverse effects of pharmaceutical prescriptions is a very high number of deaths and injuries that are caused every year around the world, you're saying that that's actually a very, very small percentage of what's actually happening. You and I, when we go on pills, think we're the consumer of the pills. But from the point of view of the pharmaceutical company, we're not. The people who consume the pill is the doctor who prescribes. And these doctors, when they prescribe you and me a pill, they consume it without anything going wrong. The things that go wrong go wrong for me and you, but the doctor consumes the pill by giving it to us, and things don't go wrong for the doctor who put us on the pill. It's not, I mean, we're in a completely different kind of situation to the pilot that flies us from Los Angeles to New York, say, where if we uh, end up going down and being killed, she is also. But the 
doctor that puts us on the pill, the doctor that tries to fly us from having an arthritis problem to not having one, well, if we get killed, they aren't. You know, they, they, they're, they're just fine. Do you think this raises a question about the role of the private market and the profit incentive in healthcare? There's problems that happen over in uh, the States where things are much more privatized than they are here in Europe, but we have comparable problems here in Europe. And in lots of respects, uh, the pharmaceutical industry prefer when medicine socialized and run by insurance companies and things like that, rather than when it's actually private. And they prefer the drugs to be available on prescription only, rather than over the counter. So in your view, the real issue is the regulatory and oversight function has, has failed here. There's a few different things. One is we've left the industry worldwide, uh, persuade us all that clinical trials are the only thing that actually counts, rather than the evidence of our own eyes. We've also let them conceal, hide the data from uh, the clinical trials in any other area of science. If I was to make a claim and didn't show people the data that supports that claim, uh, it would be the end of my career. But the pharmaceutical industry make all these claims without having to let anyone see the data behind the claims. Then there's the issue of the drugs being available on prescription only. It seemed to be a good idea back in uh, the early, first of all, uh, the 1950s when this was done first, to make new drugs available on prescription only because most people thought the average person in uh, the street is not really aware of the risks that these pills pose and doctors are much more skeptical about pills and they'll be slow to put us on the pills that we may think it will be a good idea for us to be on. Now, in actual fact, since then, since 1962, when we put this kind of arrangement in place, industry have been spending the equivalent of close to $50,000 per doctor per year to try and win the hearts and minds of the true consumer of the pill, that's the doctor. And they really have captured their hearts and minds pretty completely. Uh, so that's a problem. And then finally, to come back to the private issue that you mentioned first, one of the things that we've done is we've over-rewarded industry. We've let them take patents out on drugs, and we've let them take a particular kind of patent out on drugs that gives them vast rewards for drugs that are really scarcely beneficial at all to us. If we had the kind of system that encouraged them to make drugs for the conditions that we really need drugs for, and that ensured that the drugs that we get next year are going to be superior to the ones that we have now, then it will be worthwhile to pay huge prices. But in fact, we're getting drugs this year that are inferior to the ones we had 10 to 15 years ago, and we're paying vast amounts of money for these new drugs rather than using better, older, and cheaper drugs. This is a crazy system. David, we've been talking about um, the problems with the SSRI antidepressants and the the court trial with, with Paxil. Give us some examples of other medications, maybe also some non-psychiatric medications like the statins that also have these very serious adverse effects that aren't being addressed properly. All drugs will can cause very, very serious problems. In terms of, say, a statin group of drugs that you've just mentioned, these are drugs that are used to lower cholesterol levels. Now, for the most part, actually, we don't need our cholesterol levels lowered, but lots of doctors have been coached pretty well to ensure that anyone who's got any cholesterol at all needs to have it lowered as low as it can go. The problem with this is that we need cholesterol for a lot of things from the function of our muscles to the function of our brains. There is, for instance, much more cholesterol in your brain than there is in your bloodstream. And one of the things that uh, people find when they went on these pills was that they began to develop muscle problems. They had muscle aches and pains. And it was mild, that wasn't too bad. But for an awful lot of people, their muscles began to break down and it became a very, very serious problem. 
if you're an athlete, for instance, and you're on any of the statin group of drugs, it's going to be the end of your career. You're not going to be able to run. You're not going to be able to do the sport that you used to do beforehand. And the other thing that they can cause is they can cause very marked cognitive problems. That is, people get memory problems. I mean, they get a clinical picture that's very close to Alzheimer's. They can be almost as impaired as they would be if they had Alzheimer's dementia. And that's caused by these drugs. And it's taken 10 to 15 years or more from when the drugs were marketed first to people being aware that they can cause problems this bad. That's about the average length of time that it takes these days from the time that a drug gets launched first to the time that the field generally agrees that this drug can cause that serious problem. And if that's the length of time it takes for us to agree that a very serious and obvious problem that a drug causes, you have to ask yourself how long will it take for us to actually accept that milder problems and things that are a little bit less obvious, they're going to take a greater length of time to be picked up. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and our guest today is David Healy. He's professor of psychiatry at Cardiff University in Wales and has published more than 200 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals. He's the author of 22 books and is co-founder of risk.org. The impact of a range of drugs on how, we, how we're all able to make love or not can be huge. And there can, in fact, be enduring problems. For instance, if you go on an SSRI, most people at this stage know that this can interfere with your ability to make love in lots of ways. It can cause you not to be able to function, or it can cause you to lose interest in having any intimate contact. But what people don't often know or don't usually know is what they hear is that yes, drug can cause this, but you can stop it for the weekend and the problem clears up. When in fact, for an awful lot of people, actually, after you halt the drug, the problem can endure for months or years. This is an awfully serious problem. One of the most awful things that can happen to people, really. And it isn't just a thing that the SSRIs cause. Drugs like Accutane, can cause it. This is the drug that's used to treat acne. There's also a drug called Propecia, which is used to restore hair, and this can also cause you to have permanent impairment of your ability to make love afterwards. So there's a huge number of drugs which cause problems that many doctors might think are minor problems. You know, they're not going to kill you, but in actual fact are problems that will seriously life the rest of your life. David, one of the things that you've written about recently is the invisibility issue, the way in which adverse effects, even when someone tells them to their doctor, the doctor may not believe them or may not end up being reported at all. Say, say something about that. There was one interesting thing that happened 40 odd years ago now, which most people have heard about, but may not be absolutely sure what it means. So there was a thing called Stockholm Syndrome, uh, which was coined. And this happened when a guy with a political cause held up a bank in the Swedish capital city of Stockholm. And he held the people who were in the bank hostage for three or four days. And the army were ranged outside with guns and things like that uh, to keep an eye on things, to storm the building if need be, and bring people out if they could, and the media were also there. Now, in the end, the siege was brought to an end, and uh, the guy was brought out, and the people who had been kept hostage were also brought out, and they were met by the media who asked them, you know, about how awful it was to be in there, and did they hate this man who'd kept them hostage? And the interesting thing was that they said, no, we actually thought he was rather pleasant and we rather agree with the political views that he had, which stunned everyone. And out of this came the recognition that if your life is, is at risk and you're isolated, and these are the kinds of things that happen to you and me if we've got any serious medical problem, and if the person keeping you hostage, which is the doctor in this case, is trained to 
be nice to you, to say, have a nice day and things like this, that it becomes terribly difficult for us to voice the concerns that we have or be aware of the anger that we may have towards the person who's keeping us in this kind of position. And something similar to what happened to these people who were held hostage in at the bank happens to all of us when we're put on a pill. I've seen colleagues here who've got PhDs and who know an awful lot about healthcare. They've worked in healthcare all their lives. And when they go on a pill and things go wrong on the pill and they try to approach the doctor who's put them on the pill, even when he's an extremely nice person, I've seen them unable to voice what happened to them. I mean, they don't want to make him unhappy because they know he's been trying to help them. And they also feel that if they're feeling bad, he's the way out of the problem that they have. So they really can't afford to alienate him. And doctors generally, while they're trained to break bad news to us these days, they're not trained to have bad news broken back to them. You know, that, that the pill that they put us on isn't the right one for us. So this leads to a hostage type of situation. And it can be actually extraordinarily scary. I mean, one of the key points behind risk.org is this. Because I'm aware, and because all of us who are involved in risk are aware of how hard it can be to bring a problem like this to the doctors put you on the pill, what we've done is to create a system where you can generate a report, a written report, which you can bring to the doctor of the problem that you've got. And we've taken you through a bunch of questions as well to try and pin it down. Has the drug you're on caused the problem you're having or not? So you get a, a score which indicates that it's likely that it has or not. And the reason to do this is because if you or I go and talk to the doctor and it's just talk, he doesn't need to record in uh, the notes the things that we've actually said. And let's say we've felt very bad on this drug and that we feel that when we go out the door, we're likely to do some awful thing. Well, if we go out the door and do a an awful thing and end up dead, and there's no record there, well, there's no problem for the doctor that put you on the pills. But if you walk in the door and you're holding a piece of paper which shows what the problem is and shows that it's likely that the drug could be linked to it and that you've been asked by us to go to your doctor and he pays no heed to you and things do go wrong when you walk out the door, he's in a tricky position now. And the hope is that we want everyone who's on a pill to quality mark doctors, to report back to all of us who are the doctors that listen and who are the ones that don't. And my hope is if we can create a network of doctors that people regularly say, these guys listen to us versus the ones that don't, that we'll be able to force the ones that don't listen to begin to listen how do go out of business? And so is risk.org, is that available for anyone to just go to and to um, use its tools and to make reports and print them out for using with their doctor? Absolutely. Rxisk.org. What we've got is a few different things there. One is FDA has a database of 4.8 million reports of adverse events that have been reported in to them on every drug that you care to think of. And there's lots of companies that will sell data like this to you for a fee. What we've done is we've got all of the data and we've put it up on risk.org and it's available there for everyone listening in to the program to utilize any way they want. It could be just to look at a pill that their doctor has said they're going to put them on and you want to know a little bit more about the pill before you go on it. Or it could be that you have a husband or a wife or a child or a parent who's on pills or even maybe a friend who's on a pill and they're wondering, is this pill causing me a problem or not? Well, you'll be able to go into the data and see if anyone else has reported to FDA that the drug does cause that kind of problem or not. So all of that's there for anyone who's interested to go in and access for free. Also to report to us what the problems are that they may be having on the pill they're on. Now, we can hand your report on to FDA also, but the idea is to build up a better database even than FDA have in the sense that 
most of the reports that are there on the FDA database, while they can give us lots of information, they don't really give us good information. And people like you and me and anyone, the average person listening in here, who's motivated to get the description of the problem they're having right is going to give a much better description of uh, uh, the problem than the average doctor that rushed to uh, describe the problem in one or two words. That doesn't give us the kind of information we really need to know just what the cause of the problem is and what the knock-on impact of this could be. So, David, the, the modern drug regulatory mechanisms in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration and the trials, that really goes back to the thalidomide scandal, the sleep drug in 1962 that caused horrible, horrible birth defects, this terrible toxic effect on children. And um, then there was this big move to reform the industry and put these oversights in place. And it, it really looks that that has failed, that that effort to prevent those problems was a failure. What, in your mind, is needed? And what are the key things that need to be put in place politically, from a legislative standpoint, from a regulation standpoint, to make sure that we do have safe and honest information about pharmaceuticals and we don't have as much damage being done by these pills? I think that you're right, that the key event was the thalidomide problem. And this led, uh, as you've outlined, to the 1962 FDA Act. And to bring out just how bad the system we have now is, what we put in place then was this idea that we were going to get companies, force companies, to prove that the drugs worked and were safe before they could bring the drug on uh, the market. Now, the key the key thing that we put in place was this idea that the drug had to go through placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trials. But in fact, as of 1962, when we put that system in place, the only drug that had been through a placebo-controlled clinical trial before it was due to come on the market, and in this trial it had been shown to work well and to be completely safe, was thalidomide. So the system that we put in place to stop the problems that thalidomide caused was one that it sailed through perfectly well. And, you know, given the way things have gone since, um, what I've said earlier was that it now takes 10 to 15 years on average for a serious problem that a drug causes to be generally picked up and agreed by the field so that, yes, the drug does cause this. My hunch is that if thalidomide were to happen again, that it would take 10 to 15 years after the drug was on the market before we agreed that it did cause the problem. Because what you know, the company would be able to do is they'd be able to point to the clinical trial that showed this drug was perfectly safe. And that's the kind of thing that would slow us all down, being able to get to grips with the problem. And in fact, actually, problems like this are happening in that the antidepressants, this is a group of drugs that doubles the rate of major birth defects that children can have. It's a group of drugs that doubles the rate of miscarriages that women who are on these pills are likely to have. And it also, mothers run the drug throughout pregnancy. The children who are born in this way to show what's called developmental delay afterwards. That is, they're at risk of what we often call autistic spectrum disorders. So this is a rather thalidomide-like problem, but the SSRI group of drugs available there are in huge use for 25 years, and most doctors and most patients still don't realize that the drugs are causing this problem. Instead, what the average mother, who's probably awfully reluctant to take a pill during pregnancy, is being brainwashed by her doctor often these days, who will say things like, well, if you don't treat your nervous problem, that's what's going to cause the child to have birth defects, when in fact there's no evidence for this at all. So what do we need to do to sort the problem out? Well, two or three things. One is there's the things that the politicians can do. There's the things that we depend on people like President Obama to do. That is to look at the FDA Act and maybe say, look, the people who put this in place thought they were doing the right thing. I mean, everything about what they did looked good, make the drugs available on prescription only force companies to go through 
clinical trials to prove their drugs worked. All of these things looked good, but they produced the wrong outcome. So the politicians need to have a look at things like this and see what might be done to change it to improve the outcome. That's a top-down approach. What risk.org is the kind of thing that the rest of us can do. It's a bottom-up approach. I mean, what we can all do is adverse events, as you've outlined, have become invisible. When people are have these adverse events, the actual adverse event is not visible. And in fact, if the person goes on about it, they become invisible too. What we need to do is we need to try and make this visible again. And we can only do that by reporting them. But there's a huge amount of things I think we can do as well. I mean, it, it isn't just reporting them. One of the humbling things that's been involved in risk.org is I'm a person who's worked with the SSRI group of drugs all my life. And you'd call me an expert on this group of drugs. I know tons and tons of things about them. I mean, one case where we had a lady report to us that the SSRI that she had been put on had caused her to become alcoholic. Now, in actual fact, this was a lady who had dropped out of school early. She hadn't been to university. She didn't work in healthcare. She knew nothing about the brain and how it works and uh, the serotonin system and things like this. But because she was motivated, she went and researched it. She spent years of this. I mean, she got on the internet. She looked at all the things that uh, were actually being said about the drugs and things like this. And she was the one that worked out that after she'd become alcoholic, that actually it was the pill she was on that had caused the problem. And she didn't just work that out, but she worked out exactly how this group of drugs can cause the problem. This has been very, very sobering to realize that actually there's much more wisdom out there among motivated people than the experts have. And really what experts need to do these days is to come out of their ivory towers and really get down there and work with people because that's where the knowledge of what these drugs really doing lies. And I think risk.org is an incredible example of, of showing us the way forward with that. David, are you hopeful that we can make changes and start to turn the situation with pills around? I don't know that I can say that I'm hopeful. I think as the pharmaceutical industry capture a lot of the brightest and the best people for their marketing departments. The industry these days, what people need to realize is that it's not very good at being able to make new pills. It's not very good at being able to come up with the drugs we need for the things we need these drugs for. But it's got a lot of very, very bright people in there thinking about how to handle the politics of the whole thing. Let me give you a good example. Recently, GlaxoSmithKline was fined $3 billion by the Department of Justice for fraudulent marketing of their drugs. Now, you'd have thought this was a terribly bad thing for a company to have happen to them, that it was going to be a real stigma that would mean that, that they were going to be an outcast company from here on in for years. But in fact, one of the things that some people listening to the program may have been uh, aware of recently was that about a month back, Braxton Smith Klein made an announcement that they were going to be the company that didn't give free gifts or free inducements or money or anything in the way to any of the doctors that might be using their pills. Like free lunches and cruises and all that. Free lunches, free samples, free anything. They were going to be really proper and ethical and wonderful, okay? Now, in fact, as part of the $3 billion fine, they couldn't do any of these things. They are legally banned from doing things that the other companies can still do. But in fact, what they've done is they've turned this round to make it look that they're the best company, that better and more moral and ethical than any of the other companies are. Now, this just gives you a feel for how clever the marketing guys can be. They can even turn around a problem as big as a $3 billion fine with all sorts of things that went with it into a plus for the company. And curiously enough, over the last month or two, the, the media 
coverage for the company has been glowingly positive. They're seen as the best and most ethical of companies. So we really are up against a bunch of people who have lots of resources and are very wily. David, we are just about out of time. Give us the contact information if people want to reach you and also how they can um, access um, risk.org and make use of the resources there. Risk.org is spelled R-X-I-S-K rather than risk, R-R-I-S-K. If you go in there, you'll be able to contact me and, and all of the team linked to risk also. But the key things are you'll be able to report your story. You'll be able to con- contribute to make medicines safer for all of us, and you'll have access to a huge amount of data for free that anywhere else, if you go to try and get this, you'll be charged for it. So what we're hoping is that people generally will go in there and use it. They don't have to contribute at all, but if they can, if they can add in the adverse events that have happened to them, they can help build up a body of evidence that will be generally helpful and good for all of us, and will hopefully persuade you know, the politicians also that things can't keep going on the way they have been going on, that we need change. David Healy, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Well, it was great. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to an interview with David Healy. He is professor of psychiatry at Cardiff University in Wales and has published more than 200 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals. He's the author of 22 books and is the co-founder of risk.org. That's R-X-I-S-K dot O-R-G. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net. <laughs>